A few minutes later, after the soldiers gambled for the one-piece tunic, the man in the middle looked upon his earthly mother and she was there with family members and friends in anguish. You see, there's that word anguish, right? Looking upon the one she raised from the day of his miraculous birth, he could have thought about himself, but instead he thought not only about himself and others, but her. You see, he displayed his compassion by taking care of her needs through the responsibility given to his beloved disciple, John. Ken Geyer paints a picture for us in his book called Intense Moments of the Savior. He says the thick, dark clouds started to obscure the sun right before noon. As the centurion who was at the foot of the crosses looked, the once bright sky turned from blue to indigo to violet and finally to black. It's not an eclipse. It's not a sandstorm. It's not a cloud bank. It was more of an enveloping gloom. The raven-collared darkness wings its way across the land, leaving behind it a chill. People grow cold and they huddle together and others grow scared. The crowd thins, but darkness only thickens. For three hours, the sun refuses to shine and heaven seems to look away too. Geyer goes on and he says, The sins of the world is settling on the shoulders of the Savior. If he is there to pay its penalty, he must bear the consequences, all the consequences including the most severe, the abandonment or the forsaken of God. He has been abandoned by his friends. He's been abandoned by his family and his countrymen, but nothing like this. The fellowship is severed. The pain in his soul is like an amputation without anesthesia. And we see it. Look with me in Matthew 27, verses 45 through 47. He says, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Ali, Ali, Lima, Sabachthane. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began to say, this man is a call, calling out to Elijah. You see, they, they didn't know Psalm 22. All the Jewish people that were there around the cross should have known Psalm 22, that psalm that David wrote where this exact saying was written years before. But those who didn't know the Hebrew Scriptures, they thought that he was calling upon Elijah, the prophet. You see, what we see is the bitter cup that started in the Garden of Gethsemane and lasted three hours on the cross. It's the cup which only the Son of God can drink. No one else could drink it. Only the Son of God could drink that bitter cup and swallow it and endure it. And when we look at these passages of Scripture, we see a glaring tidal change. You see, in the previous times, it was Father. At the high priestly prayer, he says, Father. In the garden, he says, Father. At the beginning of the cross, he says, Father. But now he says, What? My God, my God. It's the cry of a human heart. It's the cry that we have in our hearts sometimes when we feel the anguish that we have been forsaken or separated from God. However, what we need to understand is this, that it was a personal cry to a personal God. My God. Personal. He says, why have you forsaken me? What does that word forsaken mean? It means abandoned 
or deserted? Have you ever felt abandoned or deserted? To turn away from or look away. You see, it's a question many of us have thought about and even ask in times of depression and deep grieves in our lives. Where are you, Lord? Job asked that question. Lord, where are you? Where, why are you so silent during this time? Why are you not hearing me? How come I can't be relieved of this anguish that's in my soul? And when we really look at that, that anguish, that deep grief, that deep sorrow that's really there, it's really a passion for the God that we know is there. We find the answer to this question in the cry of anguish on the cross in three truths. Three truths this morning we're going to look at real quickly. The cry of anguish on the cross. The anguish of sin. The anguish of judgment. And the anguish of love. Let's look at the first truth. Why the cross? The anguish of sin. You see, the reason why he is on the cross in the first place is because of sin. And Isaiah, the prophet, captures that really well in Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. He says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief, the deepest anguish. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Sound like the crowd around the cross? Guess what? If we'd have been there, we'd have been the same way. We could have cared less. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins, our inequity. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. And all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins, the sin, the transgressions, the inequity of us all. You see, we don't like to talk about sin this day and age. We don't like to talk about transgression or inequity. We like to have that feel-good feeling in our hearts about how good we are. And we are not good. Folks, we are not good. When you start looking at the meanings of the word sin, transgression, and inequity, this is what we, this is what we find. Sin is an act or feeling that transgresses something forbidden or ignores something required by God's character. So God sets this line. He sets this standard, right? And sin says, hey, what? I don't care what standard he set. I'm going to do it my way, right? It's the old Frank Sinatra song, do it my way. Well, what's transgression mean? Well, transgression means stepping across the requirement and moral standard or across the line. It's like I've said before, you go out in the woods and you see all these no trespassing signs lined up on the trees. Well, that's what God's saying about his requirement. And what do we do? Just like many times of what we've done, we stepped across that line. And then we have inequity, the inward coldness and perverseness of missing the mark. You see, that's who we are. That's who the human race is. God has set the standard, and the human race says this, I don't really care what God has done. I don't really care what he requires of me. I'm going to step across the line because of the coldness and perverseness of, our, of, of my heart. I know what the requirements are. I see the signs. I don't care because I want to do it. That's the coldness of our hearts. That's why Jesus was on the cross because of your sin and my sin. You see, we don't like to face that, do we? We don't like to look at that 
in the mirror. We don't like to come before the mirror and say, hey, that's me. We want a feel-good message this morning. Chris, I'm sorry. I'm not going to give you a feel-good message until the end. You see, we got to look at the bad news before we get to the good news. You see, the human heart is described in detail by God's Word. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, it says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways and according to his deeds. What are our deeds and what are our ways? The wages of sin is death, folks. Right? Matthew 15, 18 and 19, Jesus says this. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornifications, thefts, false witnesses, slanderers. These are the things which defile the man. You see, that's sin. That's who we are. That's our makeup. Why? Because of who? Adam and Eve who crossed the line and is handed down generation after generation after generation. Christ's passion, his anguish was for you and me. Why? To save us from ourselves, to turn us from the path of death and defeat uh, to the path of life and victory. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of our sinfulness is that death. It was Christ's cross that bared in anguish the cross that we should have bored ourselves. You see, we're the ones that were supposed to be on it. That should be you and me on that cross. But instead, it was Christ's passion for you and me, his anguish for the sin of this world. He bore it so we wouldn't have to. Sin calls the Savior to come and die. He had to become one of us except what? He was sinless instead of sinful, right? If Christ would have been a sinless person, if he had just been a person, and he wasn't God, but he was a sinless person. Do you realize that he would have only died for one sinful person? You see, many people just say, oh, he was a sinless person. He was a perfect person. Well, if that's true, then his sacrifice would have only been for one person. But since he is the God-man, God in the flesh, he could die for the sins of the world. Number two, why the cross? The anguish of judgment. The anguish of judgment. Darkness fell across the land, it says. Well, what, what does that darkness mean? It means judgment. Judgment's coming. Darkness is what? The absence of life. So when... We're talking about when darkness fell upon the land, I'm talking pitch black darkness. No light. That's why the people were scared. That's why they were cold. God was placing the sins of the world upon Jesus' shoulder. The weight of sin was so heavy because the fellowship was broken with his father. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who God made Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. At that point in time, the sins of the world fell upon God's son. And he was made sin for us. It was here where Jesus became legally guilty of our sins. Why did the scene have to happen? Judgment had to be handed down due to the nature of the crime 
a penalty must be paid for that crime. The holiness and justice of God required it. Why is it? Because God takes no pleasure in sin. You see, we have this image of God that he could care less whether we stepped across that line. We have this image of God that he's a grandfather God, a genie God who's there for our wishes. We have this image of God who winks at our sin. Oh, it, it, it's all right. Oh, it, it, it's all right. No, he is a God who is holy and just and takes no pleasure in sin. Psalm 5, 4 says this, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. He is a holy God. Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one called out to another. That's the cherubims and the seraphims on both sides of the, the throne room. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Moral evil does not even cross his mind. Jeremiah 7, 31 says, They have built the high places of Tophah, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in fire, for which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind. You see, there's no moral that, uh, evil that exists in God's mind. He is good. He is holy. He is just. And because of that, there's a required payment. And that's what we see on the cross. As Christ cried out to him. The wrath of God fell upon Jesus like a wrecking ball dropping on a and crushing a car. That's how it felt. The weight of the judgment was so heavy, the force of the judgment so powerful that only the Son of God could withstand it. The anger, the indignation, the, the wrath. No normal man could take it. Only the God-man could. Naaman 1 6 says, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and rocks are broken up by him. Christ become the curse for us, and he paid the penalty. Galatians 3 3 says, or 3 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been, become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. You see, people just thought he was a criminal. They just thought he was just like the other two because, you know what, the Jewish law says, hey, if you're hung on a tree, then you're cursed. Well, he took that curse from us. The curse of sin. As he bore the wrath meant for you and me, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that point where Jesus sensed a separation like never before from the Father that he never known. For in bearing the sin of the world, the Father had to turn judicially from the Son. That's why there was blackness. I don't know how all that happens. But I know from the depths of Christ's human heart and his human soul that there was anguish there. He was able to relate to humanity he, he, that he created. There, there was an emptiness, a broken fellowship between he and the Father. Why? Because he had to experience it so that he could relate to us as humans and, and be our advocate and be our intercessor uh, um, in sympathizing with our needs. You see, as he was drinking this bitter cup, he was thinking about you and me. See, as he was drinking that wrath, he was thinking about you and me. Why? Not only because of rescuing us from our own wicked hearts, but because he knew all humanity will stand before God in the judgment. Everyone. 
Romans 14, 12 so, so, says this, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Hebrews 9, 27 says, inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, after this comes the judgment. There are no second chances after death. There's no way that we can work ourselves out of separation of the Father after death if we have not come to him yet. He was forsaken so we would have hope not to be forsaken. God, not, God cannot arbitrarily forgive sins. He must punish evil or his justice isn't complete. He has to. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us. Number three, why the cross? It's the anguish of love. It's the anguish of love. His cry of anguish was not only for the sins of the world and the judgment that was coming up on him, but it was for the love that he had for the creation he created. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8 says. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life John 3 16 says the love of God was shown through the darkness of the judgment he displayed his love on that middle cross he sent his most valuable possession to display to the world this agape love that we hear so much of Romans 3, 23 through 25 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. The cross. He displayed Christ on the cross publicly. As a mercy seat. Christ was the propitiation. He was the mercy seat for sinners. How do we know that? Because 1 John 2.2 2 says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Christ was the mercy seat. He was the one where the blood was shed to, and, 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 and God could look down through Jesus' blood to why he requires us and how he requires us to live. And he can declare us righteous. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. Uh, <laughs> I get it, sorry. Propitiation. For our sins. I want you to think about that just a minute. How much does God love you? He sent his most precious possession to show you and demonstrate to you how much he loves you. God's mercy couldn't been released to declare the otherwise unjust sinners to be justified in his eyes without Christ being the mercy seat, the substitute for him. Christ's death brings full satisfaction to God's requirement of justice. The satisfaction not only pays for the sinner's debt of sin, but it also brings reconciliation to the world since God was in Christ reconciled Reconciling the world to himself. What does that word reconciliation mean? It means to bring together. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. What does that mean? It means objectively this. It means the potential for which Christ accomplished for all humankind. 
Subjectively, it means when we actually are reconciled. That's the choice that we have. You see, Christ died for the whole world. Objectively, potentially, that means that it was accomplished for all humankind. But subjectively, it's only there when we actually are reconciled through our choices. I ran across in my study a question from a philosopher. Her name's Eleanor Stump. And her question was this, because maybe this is the question that you have this morning. Maybe you're here asking this same question. If Christ paid for the world's sin, then why do those who do not believe in him have to pay again at the judgment? Is this judgment, justice? Is that justice? The argument comes from the basis of universalism. It's an argument of, of, of universalism. What does that mean? It means that, you know, people believe that everyone's going to go. They can live their life and everything like that, and they'll all go. Sounds like a good argument, but it's really not. You see, atonement is unconditionally applied to all sinners. It, 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 it is only applied to those who receive it. See, Christ's death is applied unconditionally to everyone. But it's only applied to those who receive it. That's the free will. That's the free choice, folks, that we have. We know that God's word teaches us this. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, it says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 4, 10 says, For it is for this we labor and strive because we have our, fixed our hope on a living God who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. 2 Peter 2, 1 says, But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Ezekiel 18.32 says, For I, God says this, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. You see, there's a difference between procurement for all and application of some. Christ achieves procurement of eternal life for everyone. The application of salvation happens unto those who believe. You say, well, Chris, I'm still not real sure about that. Well, you need to be. Christ died for you, He died for your neighbors. He died for your co-workers. He died for that person who's a saddle under your, or a burr underneath your saddle. He died for that one that you can't stand. He died for those who are in Washington, D.C. on both sides of the aisles. He's di he died for everyone. But not everyone's going to accept him. See, all persons are potentially saved through Christ's death, but some are actually saved because they receive it. But if you don't believe that, let me maybe put this into your mind and your heart this morning. Christ had put more than enough funds in the account to cover all debts of all sinners to God. Think about that. He put enough in the funds, in the account to cover all debts of sinners to God. 
However, we must draw by faith in the account for the forgiveness to take place. Have all the money in the world in the bank, but if you don't draw from it, it does you no good. Same way with Christ. You see, there's no excuses. Man has no excuse in the eyes of the Lord not to come to him for salvation because his word teaches us this. First of all, no excuses, Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they are without excuse. Secondly, God made provision for the forgiveness of sins. We've already read it, 1 John 2, 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Number three, he has revealed himself to all men. Titus 2, 11 through 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And number four, he has called all the world to salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled by God. You see, Christian, that's our duty to make sure the world knows who Jesus is and who God is, that there's forgiveness of sin and that they could be with them for all eternity. There are no excuses for anyone to say, I'm unloved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I was unchosen without hope of salvation. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. I was unable to see or hear or understand God's revelation to me. Acts 28, 27 and through 28 says, for the heart of this people have become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. You see, no sinner in hell can ask why they are there. It's because they refuse to listen and understand the gospel. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he, God, will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed one, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was never meant for human beings. But because people do not want to listen to the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is not going to force them to be with him forever, so he has to put them somewhere. And it's their choice. It's not his. We've just heard it throughout his word. It's not his choice for humans to go there. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9 says, These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. No, there won't be destructions of your soul or your physical body. Just like the believers are raised and their soul and physical bodies put back together to be with the Lord forever. It will be the same thing for the unbelievers who spend an eternity in hell. Not trying to scare y'all, okay? I'm not trying to scare y'all into making a decision. I'm, I'm teaching you what God's Word says about what life's about.
You see, what I'm trying to get at at the very end is the good news. Do you know how much God loved you and loves you? All you have to do is look at the cross. Because his son was up on the cross to pay the penalty that you and I should have paid. But it's because he willingly came to do that because of his love for us then we can trust in him and believe in him that he died, was buried, and raised again so that we can have victory in this life and the life to come. Choice is yours. God through Christ has paved the way through the cross. Why the cross? The anguish of sin was paid. Why the cross? The anguish of judgment was satisfied. Why the cross, the anguish of love was revealed. Christ was forsaken so we would not have to be. When you come to Jesus Christ and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, the promise is this, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you nor forsake you, no matter how much anguish you have in your life. He is always there and always will be. Do you have that promise today? I don't know where you're at in your walk. I don't know if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you can today. All you have to do is reach out to you. You don't have to talk to me or anybody else. All you need to do is pick up that phone and say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Allow me to repent of my sin. I'm repenting of my sin. I'm turning from my sin. I believe that Jesus did the work on the cross for me, that he died, was raised again, that he paid my penalties, and I want to trust in him today. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. It's a simple gospel. Christian, where are you at this morning? Where are you at this morning, Christian? Christian. Do you realize how much God loves you? Do you realize what he did for you and me? Do you realize that you have a responsibility of telling folks about that good news that we have? Where are you at in that? You know what? As as believers, we go through anguish, right? And that anguish, whether we know it or not, is a passion. And it's a passion to know our Savior more and more each day. Each time we go through it. Maybe the next time we go through that anguish, it'll draw us closer to Him. Remind us of the cross and the empty tomb. And as we go through that, then we are more and more like Him and in, and in his image as we go through that. Maybe this morning you just need to come to him and just share what's on your heart. The altar's open. I'm up here if you need to talk with me. The team's going to come as we sing this hymn of invitation. You do what the Lord is asking you to do this morning. Please stand.
I want to thank you for being here this morning to worship with us and to hear the Lord's word. Hope that you were challenged this morning. I know there were a lot of scriptures in this sermon this morning. If you would like a copy of this sermon to get those scriptures, just email me at Pastor Chris at waxallbaptist.org, and I'll be glad to share them with you. Sometimes I just let the Word of God explain itself, and this was one of the times that I did that. I trust that as you leave this place, that not only will you feel the presence of God, the Holy Spirit with you, but that you know that you are loved for who you are. No matter how messed up you think you are, the Lord loves you. If you don't know Him as your Savior, He loves you, and He wants you to come to Him. You don't have to get cleaned up. A lot of people think you have to get cleaned up. You don't. Just go to him and allow him to clean you up. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for a deeper look of the anguish and the passion that you had upon that cross. Thank you, Lord, that you were thinking about us, about a sinful humanity who needed to be saved. And, Father, I just pray that as we leave this place today, that, Lord, we would ponder and chew upon that uh, a little bit harder this week as we approach uh, Resurrection Sunday and as we look forward to the victory, Lord, that we will hear about and we already have if we know you. So, Father, I just pray that you would be with each and every one. I pray, Lord, for those who are sick and hurting, who's going through tests, who's going through trials, Lord, I just pray and just bring them before your throne and ask, Lord, that you would just let them know that you love them and you're right there with them and that you'll never forsake them. Thank you for all that's here. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. For it's in Jesus' most precious and blessed and powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. <laughs> 